I often wonder about the nature of reality, about our relationship to the creative force that forged the particles of our stars and intertwined them with the molecules of our bodies. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity. And if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. Welcome once again to On the Record. If you joined us last week, you heard some startling revelations about UFOs and the government cover-up about UFOs from noted UFO researcher John Lear, who has been here many times before. All right, you uh, you recently decided to take it upon yourself to try to get to the bottom of, of this major cover-up, what you say is a cover-up. You went up to Groom Lake, which you say is like a center of this UFO activity. Uh, you made a tape while you were there. Let's take a brief look at that tape if we could, and then when we come back, okay. you can explain it. We're standing just about uh, eight miles due east of Groom Lake, Nevada, the super government uh, secret test site. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs fly over there. Uh, we all watched it for about uh, seven or eight minutes. Right here, I have my Celestron scope. Uh, it's eight uh, inches. And I had, uh, uh, had it focused in for about 15 seconds and saw for myself that, in fact, it was a disk. We're going to uh, uh, stay here for another couple hours here to see if we can show you folks uh, an actual uh, extraterrestrial flying saucer being uh, flown by the government. So if you just stand by and uh, we'll be looking over that mountain, which is where they are. They also come over here, which is over at Bald Mountain. There's some lights over there, which you can't see, but there are a number of trucks. We don't know whether they're looking down here or <clears throat> what they're doing up there. But we managed to get in here. Uh, we're standing on public land. It's uh, completely legal where we are. This physicist who showed you where the saucers supposedly are flying up at Groom Lake. Mm -hmm. um, what happened is I was approached by a uh, government uh, theoretical physicist employed by the government who works on the saucers up at Groom Lake. He has seen the aliens. Uh, he is tired of the cover-up. Uh, he knows uh, what a, a rip-off it is of uh, how much, how many billions of dollars we're wasting on trying to develop, develop technology that's already been developed. And he told me when and where to stand, and uh, we drove up there. We were actually there on three occasions. I mean, the fact that, uh, that the military doesn't want you around a top secret base doesn't mean there's flying saucers there. Uh, no, it doesn't, except uh, we had just seen one. Uh, the theoretical physicist that was with us that uh, uh, told us uh, uh, where to stand and you know, what time to look, uh, the next day, he was told that uh, uh, instead of driving to work, to drive to a certain place. He was debriefed uh, with a gun in his ear and asked why, you know, he told this and told us that. And Well, he's worked in what capacity with him up there? Theoretical physicist. But, I mean, what did he do around the saucers or what? I'm just wasting my breath. All I can tell you is that when you find out the truth a month from now, a year from now, two years from now, you'll look back and you'll say, my God, the son of a gun was right. Hello and welcome to a special edition of On the Record. In the more than five years since we've been hosting these programs, no guest has inspired such a widespread and enduring audience response as has John Lear, son of the famed aviation pioneer and a world-class pilot in his own right. 
As many of you may know, though, Lear the Sun is best known for his research into UFOs, a phenomenon described by some as a worldwide hoax, described by others as the most important issue of our time. yesterday, learn something new every day. Especially how to make fake blood. Dang, this thing was, wow, this is, well, uh, one of my best experiments is I was experimenting with, you know, cleaning stuff, cleaning oil, and I mixed it all together and I put it in the tube. You know, I have kind of make my own invention, follow on with my ancestors. Grandpa was a very good pilot. He was not an inventor, but my great-grandpa was a very good inventor. Uh, the car radio and stereo he built, so that was very interesting, and he uh, and he also built the autopilot for the Air Force. Uh, when he died, he was working on a uh, water-powered school bus, which was the really interesting part. Uh, got it? All right. They, they don't want to harm you. They want to take you up. They want to make sure everything is going on with your body, okay? So what they do is they'll come down and they'll freeze time to pick you up. They take you up when you're uh, 1, 3, 9, 11, and 13. After that, they don't take care of you anymore. But what they do is they put you in their ship and uh, they take you up there and they, uh, you know, they make sure everything's running right in your body. And uh, if everything's not running right, then, you know, they're going to fix it. Like, um, I had a uh, little cramp in my leg the other day, and uh, I was, I think it was nine. And uh, I woke up the next morning, it was gone. Just, cramp was gone. My belief is, I do believe that they, ha they, they took me up there and they worked on my leg. They, you know, they helped me out. I mean, I don't believe in all that kill the aliens. You know, they're not, they don't exist. I don't believe in that stuff. So I believe they took me up, they, they, you know, they fixed up my body, and that was it. I believe that. I believe in UFOs, but I never saw one before. You seem to have an extraordinary belief. When you look up at the moon, what do you see? Three things happened within the space of a month that set my whole thinking in a different direction. The most interesting of which was a uh, photo during the night or when you can see it during the day, if you look right dead center of the moon, that is the sinus medi. Sinus medi means middle cavity. And right in the middle of the sinus medi is a tower that stands six miles high. It's made of a glass-like material because you can see through it. 
that that thing is really there. It's really six miles, all right? <clears throat> and it is something. So along with that, I had been doing some uh, studying in remote viewing. A guy like me, who doesn't know when the doorbell's going to ring or the phone's going to ring, or has absolutely no sense of something going to happen, if he could make this remote viewing work, if it was really, if I could really do it. So I went to the week class, and uh, to make a long story short, after two days, uh, it was apparent that yes, I could. It was really amazing. That was the second thing that happened, uh, seeing this, uh, other than seeing the tower. The third thing is uh, I had been talking with uh, two or three people around the United States uh, about objects on the moon. And we were sending back and forth uh, drawings and uh, and photos that uh, that were interesting. And through this, I met a, a guy uh, in Chicago who um, was uh, mailing me back and forth stuff. And of course, this was way before we had computers to email stuff. He showed me a lunar orbiter photo, lunar orbiter five, looking straight down and nestled in the uh, crater of Copernicus was a uh, uh, were five cylinders that looked like they had to be what three or four hundred feet tall and uh, it was obviously they were they were cylinders no no doubt about it and they were they just stuck up like that and I looked at it and said somebody put that there that's real I can remember the hair standing up on the back of my neck because this is real I found it this, this is something so that started me on looking at more stuff. Basically, those three things are what led me into more and more uh, interest in pictures of the moon. The moon is a place for the guards to be sure that we don't escape or don't get away uh, while we're on Earth maturing our souls. I was here working in the Rose Garden, and my eight-year-old daughter comes through that back gate and says, what is that, Mom, a UFO? And she's pointing this way, and I look up, and there's a UFO coming right over the mountain. You can see the top of Sunrise Mountain uh, behind. And as I looked up, there's another one, which she hadn't seen because she was running in with her friend. Uh, there was another one coming in behind it and traveling at unbelievable speed. I would say, <laughs> you see the two palm trees here? I would say it would have been as big from here between those two palm trees. Our guys were had to be flying those things. There was no purpose of them flying over a populated area. As many as they have up at the Area 51, um, of course our guys are gonna try you know, try them out, fly them. Um, I know Lazar was developing a, uh, a name for the fuel that they use, and did. Um, I believe it's called something 15, but you know, that's not in my area. <laughs> that's in John's area. <laughs> but uh, like I said, it's really, really been interesting married to this man. <laughs> Oh, by the way, when I'm in here with my computer, because I'll bring my uh, MacBook, it'll just collapse sometimes. Or just go completely black. And I have full battery. Let's go completely black. These are secret government operatives living across the street, taking all of these, um, you know, photos, and they're looking through the walls with this secret government telescope that you can see through walls, and they're looking at them there going through all of his computer files and he had to get a new um, computer box because they just destroyed the last one with all their stuff from their computer and they're sending transmissions over to him and they're wiping everything off and they're running the internet so slow because they're using everything they're using everything in this house to power their stuff and they're just transferring everything off and they're copying everything that's on his computer onto theirs I live somewhere across the street in one of the houses.
Grandpa. Yeah. You know the guys who are across the street taking all the stuff off the computer? Yeah. Yeah. This is the government. Because I want to know something. I definitely want to know something. They're looking for, they're looking for something. I thought it was 88, because 87 they start, they just started it. Yeah, 87. But 88 was when they really started going through everything. In 2012, minus 1988, 24 years. 24 years. Yeah, the exactly. first time we found out about it is the... Uh, the, the uh, telephone guy that used to work on Allison's and Jack's phone because when they're teenagers, they're always changing lines and place different phones and stuff. I know how that. Yeah, one day he told me that. Uh, Did you know there's a, a tap on your phone? I said no. He said, "Do you want me to check it out?" And I said, "No, they're they're harmless." He said, "Well, I'd like to check it out." And I said, "Hey, help yourself." So he came back in a half an hour and he said, "I went down Monroe." I went down Hollywood, Hollywood to Bonanza, and I went as far as Nellis, and it's farther than that, the tap. So uh, he says, I'm going to check at the office. So the next morning he came, he says, John, I can't work on your phones anymore. And I said, why not? He says, because your phone is tapped at the mainframe and there's no paperwork. And I went to my supervisor about it, and she said, if you don't like your job, quit. Well... They wouldn't want to rob this place, I'll tell you that. <laughs> My pistol packing grandma. It was at the opening of the uh, fashion show mall. And this kid ran, I was just putting three children in the, my two granddaughters, or my two daughters, and uh, in the back of the car and their friend. And this kid ran up and said, give me your money. And I said, okay. Took my purse out. He's holding a gun, 22 on me. And um, I uh, pulled my 45 on him, and he turned and ran, reached back and grazed my leg, fired a shot. So at that time, I didn't keep a round in the chamber, but I do now. <laughs> a 22, come on. He just picked the wrong person. It doesn't just happen, it's written the exact second that we're going to die. Am I going to leave a message for my family uh, to open on my demise about what I've discovered? I think it's pretty well out there what I've discovered. I hadn't thought about it. Maybe I'll give it some thought and leave some kind of message like that. The message is pretty scary. It's hard to tell people that you're owned lock, stock, and barrel by the ETs. You don't do anything that they don't know about, haven't directed and personally uh, guided. We've done everything that they have uh, told us to do. Now, as we walk through the path of life, Sometimes if things aren't going too good, that means we're on the wrong path. Everything has been predetermined. It's all been written. Uh, there should be no variation. You get off the path, you're gently guided back onto the path uh, to the living with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed. <laughs>